Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, brown bag lunch. And today I have the pleasure of introducing Sandy Ng, as you can see, who's now at Hong Kong Polytechnic University, where she's an assistant professor, an associate professor, I'm sorry. Uh, but Sandy studied in Hawaii, and then after that it, at what we colloquially know in Britain as SOAS, which is the School of Oriental and African Studies. And as we were discussing this, that is not a school for children. <laughs> that is a school for advanced research in the, uh, all aspects of the culture and history and literature of uh, the, as we used to be called, the Orient and Africa. Sandy has worked on a range of topics, but her principal area is looking at ways in which tradition and modernity clash in Chinese art and design. Although, I gather recently, she has moved over to consider more specifically uh, topics related to gender. And I think some of that is going to arise today, because as you can see, her topic is design and the feminine self in early 20th century visual culture in China. So, please welcome Sandy to this brown bag lunch. Thank you. Thank you for that very nice introduction, and thank you very much um, for having me. Um, uh, my presentation today will be separated into two parts, um, and I'm going to read some and then talk about the images. I hope that's all right with you. So my um, area of interest or area of research is really modern Chinese arts and culture. In my doctoral research, I was trying to find out how arts was modernized in 20th century China. But for this um, current research topic that I'm working on right now, um, I came up with a very simple question at first, which was, how did Chinese people become modern? And then when I thought about it some more, I have three main questions, which are how has modernization transformed the ways people live and use designs and products? Um, how has the change of lifestyle altered the culture? And the third question, which is actually the main question for this project that I'm doing, is what about ordinary women who experience social and cultural changes, especially in the Republican period between 1912 and 1949? So let me begin the presentation. In exotic commodities, modern object in everyday life in China, the author Frank Dakota proclaims, and I quote, modernity had to be brought home in order to propel one's country into the universe of civilized nation and join a universal march towards a better future. For Chinese citizens of this period, to buy foreign was modern. Hybrid design initiates modern living, while appropriation affirms a new identity that centers on the self in modern China. Women, in particular, play a crucial role in introducing imported products and new design to the masses. They did so through consumption and representation. Advertising posters, also known as calendar poster because of its initial inclusion of calendar, employ images of attractive and fashionable women to introduce novel products to consumers. New and Western designs were part of the composition impressing the consumers with a modern lifestyle that fulfilled a fantasy of progress. So in this project, um, I have four types of images that I have to deal with. And for this presentation, I'm only really going to talk about the first two. Um, the first one is women as models to sell products featuring local and Western design. And there's a bit of um, photography or photographs of women as well. And then the last two I'm going to deal with in my project are advertisement that shows women caring for themselves or improving themselves through learning how to use designs and products and women as portrayed in films. Change, however, was deemed unchanged. Some resisted firmly. In many households, the old blended with the new without any cultural conflict. Ordinary people were more concerned with actual usage of goods rather than their presumed origins. Mass-produced glass mirrors were much brighter and shinier than copper or tin mirrors. Instead of using them for vanity, they became 
instrumental in cosmological conception of spiritual forces such as repelling um, evil. Many believe that demons were frightened by their ugly selves, echoing here, and would be discouraged from entering the home if they saw their own reflections. Mirrors are also deployed to enliven confined space, like the bathroom and kitchen. Spectacle, as we see here, is another symbol of modernity that signal wealth and education because the wearer bestowed a scholarly impression, which still rings true today. People with sight problem regarded them as an ingenious invention, and those who wanted to look modern um, wore them as fashion accessories. They were even used to shield bride's eyes in the so-called civilized wedding, replacing traditional headscarf. In rough weather, people wore spectacles to protect their eyes from dust or the glare of the sun. Glass, as a material, became a new luxurious and affordable material, transforming people's home and lifestyle. Local people creatively incorporated indigenous social etiquettes and purposes in imported products not intended by their producers. Globalization motivated appropriation in which ordinary people used and circulate things in culturally specific ways. Modernization manifests visually through people's fondness of photographs and entertainment like peep shows and movies. Photographs help Chinese people to discover their selves and characters. Some photos are marked, and I quote, the second eye, that emphasize the significance of image as an important source of self-representation. People hang their photos in homes everywhere. Characteristic from paintings like calligraphy were incorporated to bridge the gap between traditional representation and modern depiction. Later. <laughs> you don't want to do that now. <laughs> Many studios were available for people to have their portraits taken. Props were used to create illusions of modern atmosphere. Full length photographs as the one shown here, were preferred as half-length was typically used for funeral. Family portraits were important as the core of social representation of identity. Documenting one's relation to others was as critical as a portrayal of the self. Photographs became a means of advertising for courtesans and prostitutes. Clients were fond of the pictorial souvenirs. So we can see that viewing and being viewed were an integral part of modern visual culture. To be modern was to be fashionable. So this is the first example of the calendar poster I mentioned earlier. Half of the ordinary population dressed in imported clothes or foreign style garments. Western clothes were mixed with native outfits. In this calendar poster for Russian tobacco, a young woman is featured in a Chinese style dress with a luxurious fur collar coat and white gloves. Her hybrid style shows that she's thoroughly, her thoroughly modern fashion combines the indigenous and the foreign. Some poster designs bear traditional elements such as familiar garden or interior setting to avoid appearing too exotic to the Chinese. The model here Posts in a Chinese garden featuring slender bamboo and traditional architecture with advertised cigarette packages placed underneath the poetic images. image. Adaptation of Euro-American Euro concepts of modernism in local context resulted in hybridity in poster design and the merchandises promoted became broadly accepted. Hybrid designs were instrumental in expressing ideals of modern living in China. To be modern was to groom oneself because hygienic and attractive appearance was the measure of a civilized society. Being hygienic was paramount as the concepts manifested in different types of products, including dumplings and shoes. Hats also became popular for both gender. And the calendar poster seen here um, advertising electric light and battery, um, and battery the young woman dons a French beret and her autumn leaf pattern chipao, which is a slender dress that was created in the early 20th century. And it was a very popular outfit for women. But here you see that leather shoes um, became important tools of self-representation. They were trendy necessity because of the material's durability and its ability to keep the feet dry and warm. 
High heels replaced bound foot shoes, which also gave the illusion of smaller feet. Foot binding was banned in 1912 with the establishment of the New Republic, but it was practiced well into the 1950s in some rural areas. Bound foot women filled leather shoes with papers for better fitting. In the next example, slightly different, um, you see here a, long, a woman with a long orange scarf that acts as a hair ornament that contrasts sharply with the woman's bright blue cheek. The image is really not a calendar poster yet, but it was designed as a prototype to advertise a product or a service, which was a common practice. Demonstrating that female representation was integral in familiarizing consumers with new products and design. Calendar poster from 20th century China attest that images of women are in instrument of modernity that introduce contemporary living to Chinese culture. Example includes advertisements that feature Western furniture in interior design and promotion of family as well as personal hygiene products imported from Europe and America. The design combined characteristics from traditional paintings of beauty, um, known as Mie Noir, with modern fashion like high heel shoes, qi pao, furnishing to make the pictures look both novel, yet recognizable for the Chinese. In this example, you see here, this is a calendar poster that advertises, in fact, a medical um, company or service. A lady in dressing gown appears to have just gotten out of bed in a Western-style bedroom. Chinese sentiment is subduedly, so this is just a comparison of the Western-style bedroom and in this um, particular bedroom right here. Chinese sentiment is subduedly embodied in the painting of cranes, symbol of good fortunes and longevity on a floor mat. So this is an example of um, painting cranes, and this is the floor mat, and this is the crane right there. So you have to sort of look sideways. Westernized <coughs> interior could only be afforded by the affluent and the educated. Books on the nightstand suggest that she's a cultured person. A flag of undefined origin is placed on top of the headboard, right there, with a frame watercolor on top of what looks like a photographic um, portrait. So this looks like some sort of photographic portrait, and this is a painting of sorts. Now, this watercolor painting captures a floral motif that mirrors the flowers outside the window and the flowery pattern on her duvet covers. So we see here that display of visual objects was essential in modern life. <coughs> Female images became entwined in the process of modernization, in which foreign products were familiarized to <coughs> local designs. Familiarization of foreign products in 20th century China went through processes of appropriation involving taste, price, novelty, and perceived use, um, usefulness, quality, availability, and marketing. In this next example, also advertising um, tobacco, a woman in a study is portrayed with a cigarette package on the desk. She's in the act of smoking, which was deemed undesirable because loose women and prostitutes were known to be average smokers. By placing the model in a Western style study, it bettered the negative image of women smoking, eased the mind of female smokers, and associated smoking with intellectual activities. So you can see here, this is Ian Foster's private study room, and this is fairly similar in terms of um, uh, arrangement. And I think this particular composition with the lady standing in front of the desk with all these Western design, it was probably a very popular composition because I found several um, versions of it with the woman looking slightly different in each one. In this one though, her awkward posture points to the practice of employing male models to dress up as women because no decent ladies at this time would take on a modeling job that was deemed dubious. The stiffness in rendering, for example, if you look at her feet, she appears to have two left foot indicator features, <laughs> lack of training on depicting human figures. A frame landscape on the right, and a photograph of indistinct subject on the desk emphasize the role of representation in daily life. Advertising shapes the consumer, educate and transform her tastes and habits. Portrayal of charming modern women appeal to gazes of female consumers. Graphic design emphasizes women as integral to consumer culture and as fashionable participants in modern life. In this next example, that advertise um, liquor. 
um, imported lace clicker. A young beauty is in a transparent street house <laughs> seductively in a western interior. Her bejeweled appearance embodies a modern and confident woman. The manicure left hand flaunts a large diamond ring and a wristwatch while a diamond bracelet grazes her right wrist that gently support her face. Expensive jewelry were favorite items for affluent city dwellers in the early 20th century. She waits for, and I might add, a male companion to enjoy the champagne already poured into glasses on the table that emphasize the advertised imported alcohol. Her alluring pose shares a similar demeanor with a French advertising poster that also promotes um, alcohol. The composition also captures characteristics often seen in traditional paintings of beauty, like the example here, that feature charming women in interiors that comprise of luxurious material culture that signify the woman's social status and sometimes her state of mind. So this is also part of my research project as well, to look back in historical representation of women and how designs are deployed to signal her identity and maybe her state of mind at the time. And I'm trying to see if I can connect these two types of um, images. Women participation in metropolitan life, modern consumer culture, and material <coughs> culture poster are intrinsically um, connected. Judith Williamson, in her study on decoding advertisement, declares, and I quote, We women and those goods are interchangeable. They are selling us ourselves, end quote. In selling women a variety of goods, the posters sell women their new selves. Many graphic representations associated middle-class women with a lifestyle that necessitate access to public space. Shopping offers socially acceptable space and context for women to explore the city. Women enjoy greater mobility, changing the cityscapes and their identities. In this example you see here, which is a poster that advertises um, cosmetic, a woman stands in front of a sumptuous Western-style vanity set. She's returned from shopping and has taken off her fur trim coat and scarf, hung on the chair where the cosmetic products are displayed in the box. Woman grooming in front of mirror is an established genre in both Western and Chinese artistic tradition. But in this poster, she looks at the perfume spray bottle held gently in her hands instead of gazing at her own reflection. The product is her new reflection her new selves. Consumption is appropriation. It is a social activity by which objects become one's own by subjecting them to personal meanings and usage. Objects have lives granted by the users, not intended by the producers. The act of appropriation imbues objects with personal characteristics. It blurs the boundary between object and person. Objects and behaviors are subjected to personal meanings and differential um, usages in culturally specific ways, fostered by advertising and experience of consumers. Appropriation enables objects and new habits to become an extension of themselves, and that solves it's often feminine. So, because I'm thinking about uh, individuality and the selves, and I keep looking at images like this when I'm doing my literature review, and I came across this, he devotes the society of spectacle, which I think one of his many, many interesting ideas is this, um, which is our experience and social relations are mediated through images. So I keep looking at the theory and I keep looking at the images, which led me to the next part of my um, presentation, which is a little bit fragmented because I'm still working on the logic um, of the argument. So visual representation of women construct a range of meanings that explain women's visibility, with modernity intensifying the visual scenes and place much emphasis on women appearing in public. Consequently, female subjectivity was increasingly expressed in imagery, marked by a dramatic historical shift. Women were encouraged by representation of their gender to articulate themselves as modern subject by constituting themselves as spectacles. Appearing in public described how the changed conditions of female visibility and modernity invited the perform a performance of the self. Female visibility refers to a range of women capacity to be seen, which differs from being represented. For example, being seen in public, being photographed, 
and having a sense of self-awareness as perceived in a mirror. Modern women became spectacles and the performance of their gender helped them play an active role in the modern everyday life. So in this part, I actually have more questions rather than answer. And here are some of um, my questions. So I asked, did women's visibility merely render them as objects? Was their visibility crucial in their cultural representation that led to an emancipated ideal of the modern woman? Did women gain subjectivity through deliberate and active objectification? And could women have an authentic and authoritative cultural present to start with, which they then lost in modernity, especially through over-representation? Um, so in the 20th century, modern women understood self-display to be part of the search for mobility, self-determination, and sexual identity. Shifting from modesty to display, from self-effacement to self-articulation, tie female visibility to women's modern subjectivity. Emancipation and self-definition came with visibility, but they also became idealized. The feminine as a cultural form and as a subjective practice foreground the complexity between representation and subjectivity. So this image which I already saw, I think traditionally people would say this is a woman being objectified, but I'm trying to argue otherwise, that there's subjectivity in an image like this because women look at them and they want to become these women or become these images, which I will show example in a moment. Walter Benjamin believed that modern observer subjectivity is altered by mass culture. His ambivalence towards mass culture is expressed through reference to the metaphorical figure of a woman, a figure that stands for modernity and its instability. I tried to argue in my project that modern woman embodied the instability through her own artificiality that made her a symbol of the evolving modern gender identity. So I asked, how can artificial and unstable modern woman process a subjectivity? The answer, I hope, would be the modern woman and her selfhood were created by active objectification. It is through visual representation that modern women gain subjectivity that can only strengthen through representation and reproduction. Woman over-identification with image could be problematic, and I see that because they became equated with the imagery and were unable to detach themselves. For the female spectator, there's a certain over-present of the image. But I would say women do not simply view, see, or observe like men. It is precisely the wish to identify that allow women spectator to gain subjectivity, to mirror the woman portrayed. Making oneself a spectacle involves picturing oneself as image in order to facilitate a performance of the modern identity. By mimicking the portrayed females in the image, women practice their visibility, which is the symbolic performance of their gender identity. Their appearance was a condition of their femininity. By taking on this act through dressing, behaving, and purchasing new goods, they became visible, decent, respectable, and therefore feminine and modern. So an image, in this kind of image, um, we see a fashionable woman, but we also see a woman who is out in the public, perhaps she works on the plane that's behind her, or perhaps she's a traveler. And I'm trying to argue that this type of image encourage women to gain a sense of self, to better themselves, or to improve themselves, to be more like this type of woman being depicted. So women and commodities were growing more entwined in the visual economy of <coughs> commodity culture, its logic of display and the positioning of the female spectator. Women cast themselves as spectacles, affirming the process of commodity aesthetic into the production of the modern woman, placing them in the capitalist economy. So I ask, I think I have to hear. Did visual display of womanhood make modern feminine identity artificial? And the mass-produced images of women illusionary, causing women to over-identify with the modern spectacle. The feminine was associated with commodity exchange, looking and the gaze in the city. Women became active spectator, which encouraged them to make themselves into the image that they see. So this is um, 
a calendar poster, again, advertising tobacco, which I saw in the British Museum. And this one, the quality is actually um, very good, if I may add, because the quality of these posters really um, varied. And this one I find interesting, and you start to see a lot of this type of representation of women, where it's very close up, and she's sort of lost in her own thought, as if she's seeing her own reflection. And I also find interesting in the packages of these products, here is another representation of women. So female images are very important um, in this particular period that I'm working on. So just a close up of this image here. And this one actually includes um, a calendar. So that led me to look at something like this. You have lots of examples of women going to um, photography studio to take this type of image where she's photographed looking at herself, this kind of reflexicity that I think was encouraged by this type um, of image. So female representation became role model that invited women to identify with the spectacle. They purchased the advertised goods to appear modern and to fashion an improved self. Shopping gave women means to venture into public space Commodity culture encourages to look and spend, giving them a sense of freedom. Advertisers understood the importance of capitalizing on women's presence. The ads directed women's gaze to the goods and to themselves, like this one here. The commodity culture shifted emphasis from traditional virtue to improving the person physically and psychologically. The logic of display became feminized because women were deemed more susceptible to the spectacle and identification with the images. Mirrors became essential in de department display and in um, photographs taken in the um, studio. Women's reflection became part of the display, giving them subjectivity. Ad shows that women must appear correctly to display the mastery of the self and visual effects again, such as something like this. Commodity helped women gain confidence and turn themselves into desirable vision. Self-transformation that led to social desirability was the key to a successful um, modern woman. So this is why I'm trying to work on here, um, is through seeing themselves that I think women understood how to improve themselves. The new feminine subjectivity emerged through consumption and production of self as commodity image which gave them access to modernity. The changed conditions of women's public visibility restructured the relation between representation and subjectivity, rendering them part of the modern um, visuality. Finally, female visibility, I try to argue, is the conflation between object and subject. The moment when the subject expresses itself as object and the object becoming the subject. Women's visibility oscillates between cultural representation and subjective self-representation, demonstrating individuals <coughs> are sites and subjects of struggle for their identity. So you also have a lot of this type of example of women um, being photographed in a um, photograph um, studio. And I'm working not only with the image of the woman, but also the designs that serve not as functional items that they not use. They almost never sit on them. So they serve as a kind of symbolic function. And so this lady, the way she's dressed, obviously she comes from a fairly privileged or affluent class, but it's not just this class of women who want to be the spectacle, who wants to participate in this kind of self-reflectiveness. You also have ordinary women. Clearly, this is a different class of women who had her photograph taken, and I find it interesting too. So again, the design is there to serve a symbolic purpose, and uh, I'm still thinking about how it's really interesting that they assign the design to the social station of the woman. This is clearly a, a more classical chair, and this is a more ordinary looking chair that would go with actually the, the subject. Um, so this part I'm working on and I'm reading a lot of theories on objecthood and on, on thing theory to 
really think about um, how objects are used in relation to people's um, social station or social status. So let me just here very roughly conclude. Imagery of women is closely tied to the formation of um, feminine identity. Visibility and modern image production created a new woman. Her appearance helped explore female subjectivity in the cultural space where she was visible, opening a different kind of engagement between women and cultural manifestation. Women challenged the traditional status of being a female as objects by occupying the images through making herself visible and public. They assumed subject formation that destabilized the meanings and effects of the images, which opened up cultural space for women to adapt the use and effects of power. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, and this is what I did not include. Um, this is the mirror that I spoke about in the beginning part of my presentation. So you don't actually look into it for vanity purpose. This is usually put outside of the door of houses or apartment to repel evil from enter entering the house. So this is an example that I forgot to include. All right. We'll leave the pictures up in case we want to go back to them. Okay. So uh, let me throw it open now and uh, invite any questions. Or okay. I can ask. I can start. Um, um, a couple of things. I was first one is I'm wondering whether you looked at Japanese prints and Japanese images, um, because you're looking back towards Qing art and even earlier Song art. Yeah. But in many ways, a lot of the images that you're looking at, um, you know, you've got a whole body of Japanese advertisements, right? Which, especially if you're looking at Shanghai, which were mm -hmm. highly influential, and you're interested in mirrors and the Japanese, um, you know, all those advertising goes back to Yukio and that interest in mirrors. Yeah. So I was wondering whether you looked at Japanese art. I, I'm, I'm actually starting to, and I know there's like a huge range. Because I think that might bring a different sort of transcultural transnational cosmopolitanism, which I think is very evident in these particular mm -hmm. ads itself, especially since so many of these companies were actually not Chinese. Yes, that's right. They're mostly foreign. Right, um, yeah. Japanese, a, Japanese Russian, Russian, Amer Russian, yeah. Russian yeah. Amer sometimes American. Yeah. yeah. Um, my second question, I'm actually interested in the standing pose, because mm -hmm. that is rather unusual. And um, because you do see a lot of people prior to this period of uh, photographs of women will be sitting. Yeah. And then there's a lot of these, and at the same time these were going on, there's lots of pictures of women sitting cross-legged, you know, Francesca yeah. del, del uh, Lago is one of the cross-legged women as the transgressive woman. Yeah. So I'm wondering if the standing woman itself is a different way of regulating a woman's body as a way of trying to introduce a different sort of modern code of social behavior. Yeah. Um, I, I a, a modern behaviour which is also itself less transgressive. It's modern, yeah. but not that transgressive. I was wondering if that's kind of what's going on here, because it's rather unusual to not sit down in a chair. Yeah, so I, I would agree. So the cross-legged woman, I think at this time in China, was considered transgressive or a little bit too sexually available. So I think the standing pose is basically presenting them as upright, like literally, like not just physically, but morally as well. They're upright, educated, but, cultured women. But then how would you link that to earlier traditions where people would sit down? That's a good question. I, I, I will have to actually think think about that between the, the sitting and, and the standing. I think the standing is much more presentational. Much more, I, I think, it gives her much more of awareness of her sense of self. That's how I would see that. Do you know where those sources of those photographs come from? Especially the one of the poor woman the poor, clearly socialists, yeah. Well, um, the, I, if I remember correctly, the images in this presentation, come, the calendar poster comes mostly from actually Fukuoka um, Museum in, in Japan. They have a very good selection. Now, the photographs of there's a woman, there's a young woman that you showed yeah. with the pool. The, the, that, you, you one, I, I, that one comes from, I think, the Hong Kong Museum of um, History. But you don't know what the sort because it feels almost documentary. There feels something about it because there was also a rise in interest in anthropology at this moment right. in time. So I'm wondering whether that also belonged not to the world of commercialism that right. you're choosing, but belonged to a different emerging world of documenting. 
Right. Well, um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but when I asked the um, librarian about the source, um, they said that they have a whole lot of um, photographs from this period that were just donated to, to their museum. So but they don't know where, what the original intent no. of these photographs So I, I suspect someone collected them for their own interest and then they then decide to donate it to the, the whole collection to the museum. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if the owner, the original owner of the photograph were related to the subjects, for instance. Mm -hmm. I suppose I'm wondering whether these are portraits or as opposed to documenting social types. I think that's a better way of putting it. Well, the way I would look at them, I think they're more portrait rather than documentary. I, I think, and somehow the owner of that collection just got hold of them, that, maybe out of his own interest, because it's a really broad range of different women. It's a weird portrait, though. They, they I'm are. Not sure, I'm not sure. I'm convinced that they, these are portraits. I, yeah. it's, I, I, I have to. The go one of the first more. one that you showed, I will agree, is a portrait because that studio that set one, in itself. Yeah. That that I will agree is because I think that's about class. That's yeah. about that's trying to make a studio not look like a studio and domesticating yeah. this yeah. as a, so it gives her some sort of like commercial authority or whatever uh -huh. you want to uh -huh. however you want to argue it. But the other one that you had, I think is I'm not convinced. That's it, I I know what you mean. It looks more like a documentary type, it's like face on. Yeah. This, it follows particular kind of principles of of analytical way of thinking. Yeah. It doesn't fit into a Chinese aesthetic of portraiture. But it doesn't, do you know what I mean? It's just I know what you mean, because I think at the time, this type of photograph, um, photog Western photographer, for instance, would take them to document this is what a Chinese woman looked like in China at this time. But then if that's the case, then how is she has, sub where is her subjectivity, right? I mean, that's, that's what, I suppose that's what I'm trying to figure out. That's true. I'll, I'll have to go and work on that. I, that's super interesting. I have a follow-up to that. One, one thing I was wondering is about, um, just on the lines of how are these being used, do you have an understanding of certain photography studios that perhaps you could drill down? Um, that, because I think you've you've made a lot of really interesting connections between what's happening in marketing and in personal representation, but it's um, I think this argument about agency can be really mm -hmm. um, enhanced by looking by understanding a bit more about the production of images like this and if if they're being produced to send to people are they are they part of a of a trading network or um how they relate to celebrity photographs and if um if if these collections are are really just uh somewhat anonymous people or or are these figures or you know can you give identity to any of these people because you you had said a when when you had sort of uh, talked about these images displaying class, I would question whether they do or not because I think that's one of the incredible things about photography at this time is that there's a flattening mm -hmm. of of class and representation, and that it we can't necessarily trust the image that we're seeing here, the reflection that we're getting, mm -hmm. and so. Um, I think whatever contextual information, and, and this image in particular on the, the top left that you have an inscription here and what that says and, and what we can can read into the image besides the actual image itself. Yeah. Well, that, that's actually a really good question and statement. This one, and I think the other one too, the other one too. Um, okay, this one has the writing on the top left. This one has writing on the back. Um, we know that this type of image, women would take these um, photographs and they would then get multiple copies and they would then give them away. They would sign them to maybe to friends and family. It's almost like gift of this is who I am. So yeah, so that's related to I think that's great said. evidence. Yeah. I, yeah. And they would sometimes, not a letter, but write more than just to somebody and signed it. They would write something that's meaningful between the, the subject and then the friend or the relative that she's giving the image to. Yeah, and I had the same question about marketing materials as well, like how these things survive. Because, um, you know, an idea of women being being active spectators mm -hmm. are, you know, they're, they're not generating I, I am assuming that women aren't actively actively involved in creating images like this, but if if their collecting of them or trading of those materials can kind of add to your discussion. Mm -hmm.
Well, they're definitely looking at them because these posters were displayed in home, and sometimes I found photographs when they're displayed like outside of shops because mm. they're treated as as advertisement. So these women or women at this time were looking at these images, just like how we look at ads when we go to the subway or, or the bus. So they they're very exposed to images like this. I actually also had a question about the marketing material and who was creating like the calendars and tobacco ads because as women were responding to them and maybe becoming more modern it complicates it possibly if like these are really created by male designers and male like this is a marketing campaign surely aimed at women that seems to have adjusted their they're thinking about clothing and representation but not exactly originated by women mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is th that's where the complexity comes in. If if the I I would say all of these, um, when they were first designed, they were actually original paintings, um, and then they would get printed. So they would be worked on and designed by men. But then the targeted or um, audience or the consumer would be both gender. But I would say it was the women who react more mm -hmm. to this type of men image than than men. So I do have this gap about the, the one who's doing the portraying and the one who's being portrayed. Questions? Oh, sorry. Did okay, you get these ads in women's magazines? Some of them, yeah. Well, look, yeah, so you will, that will be one way of thinking about audience. Yeah, some of them, in, in especially um, magazines or journals for aimed at women. Yeah, like Liang Yang, one of yeah. those. Yeah. Aimed at women. Hi, um, I'm curious about um, how you think about the relationship between a lot of um, social movements at that time in the 1920s, 30s, till later 40s, from new cultural movement to new woman movement, and also the promote of the Republican government to to um, advertise the importance of physics mm -hmm. for the new nation. Yeah. And how is that? Is that is there a possible relationship between <coughs> those social rhetoric happening at, at that, that changing social rhetorics happening at that time related to the changing portrayal of women as well as um, the subjectivity that you are trying to argue? So is there a possible relationship between like the importance of um, physics, not just for women but also for men, yeah. related to the ups, uh, like? up front, like the standing posture, so on and so forth. I'm just curious about that. Um, there's definitely a correlation between a lot of the social <coughs> movement, um, especially for women, with these images. And um, the especially the part you mentioned about um, sort of the promotion of a healthy, robust yeah. physique. Um, I don't have any um, example here, but you do have ad also, particularly if they are for products that are um, related to hygiene, or health, I mean, those ads literally would teach women how to improve their physical body. So, and of course, that's also related to the fact that um, women are there to reproduce healthy children for a healthy nation. So this is, I think, the third kind of image that I will work on for, for um, th this project. Um, um, to add on that, so I'm thinking about the comparison you made between these uh, women like painting calendar um, women's images in calendars and advertisements in the period and the earlier um, beauty images that you were using. Um, maybe I would consider more about the context in which they were produced. So this one was is a time period when China was trying to now have a name called China because previous it's Qing Dynasty. You don't even know what a country is. The whole country was trying to figure out but how does it mean to be China? And they were trying to figure out what does it mean to be a new woman in a new China, in a new country. So compare that was like a song painting of beauties, like st sitting in front of a mirror and trying to long for her companion and that kind of thing. I'm just, I would um, think a little more about the context for which it is produced and how it obviously there is a continuity in terms of the an image and the picture how it's produced but I'm just curious how you would figure that out but it's fascinating yeah so um, just a, a very quick response to that again I don't have 
because I have a lot of this type of image. But you also have um, calendar poster like this, where they feature um, young females, and it's very obvious that they're students. And there would be some moral message, especially about saving money, about frugality, because if you know how to save money for yourself, you then also saving for the nation. So there's a lot of um, meanings behind these commercial and, and um, marketing images, which I think ties to what you say about creating not only a new woman, but ultimately I think this type of image maybe help create a, a new China that's stronger economically and culturally. Can I ask you a question? Yes. You touched on, as I said, the props as signifiers yes. of, say, westernization oh. or status or whatever. But it strikes me that there's a number, as with all kinds of visual culture or visual analysis at least, there's quite a number of other areas that I would have thought might be very revealing. That struck me hairstyles, mm -hmm. fashion. Mm -hmm and certain other areas. So I can't judge these, but I would have thought that these would be very rewarding areas yeah. to, if you're wanting to trace a significant shift in the Republican period yeah. between traditional and perhaps modern or Western dress. But I, 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 this was turning in my mind because I can make that kind of analysis, but perhaps yeah. it's an area that you would be find well, more useful. Like in this one, for example, her outfit is um, fairly common and, and traditional, the two-piece, but I think she's wearing leather shoes. <clears throat> and a lot of them, especially if they are portrait and they want to appear to be a certain class of woman, they like to hold a book. The book is also part of the prop. So I'm always zooming in to see what is the book? What are they supposed to be reading? Sometimes they like cooking book. Sometimes they're novels. So, um, so like, all, all this is quite interesting. So yeah. I'm all into like reading the image, trying to decipher the image, because I think the image tells you um, a, a lot of things. But yeah, her hairstyle is quite traditional in this one, I think. It struck me that, I, as again, I couldn't judge, but many of the calendar pictures were possibly Western hairstyles, but yeah. I wouldn't. Yeah, that's a Western. Yes. And, and she's in, again, West, she's very westernised. In, in and this presumably one. there is documentary evidence of perhaps the rise of hairdressers who would do this kind yes. of hairstyles in Republican China. Yeah. So. Any other questions for me? Because that would help me a lot. <laughs> um, I just wondered if you kind of thought about, like, um, in terms of theory, like the idea of like the male gaze and then kind of like the turn towards the female gaze yeah. and how that's maybe like impacted you with. Yeah, I, I think about that a lot, like the, yeah. the gaze and sometimes, I mean maybe not in this one so much, this one she's sort of lost in her thought but sometimes the, the up closeness of the image, she's not only returning the gaze, she's challenging mm -hmm. the gaze which is where I think about the whole notion of sub, um, subjectivity, that the image is very knowing, if, if you see what I mean. Like there's a sense of self-awareness rather than just being a represented um, object. Any other questions? No, it's well, just, yeah. so it's not a question, it's just uh, kind of, you know, because this reminds me actually of, I read this recent article who actually goes in the same way, uh, but for, like, it's this scholar who is actually going to BGC next semester to do the exhibition on uh, fashion and war. So her name is Sophie Gurdjian, and she has studied actually the way, like, to go, like, to, to, to leave this new cultural history approach of objectifying women in the 1920s and 1930s, through the lens of Scott and then Marie-Louise Roberts and stuff like that, to go to this idea of like, there are real subjects through the ads. It's, it's actually really focused on French advertisement, but I guess there are like many theory elements that could be interesting also uh, about this idea that the way they are displaying themselves with makeup and stuff like that is completely new and gives them 
a new kind of freedom that we cannot really, that it's hard actually to balance what is freedom and what is unfreedom in these types of advertisements. So yeah, that was just uh, I was just thinking of this of in term in terms of like advertisements and self display and stuff like that. And I would say just a quick response. Um, this is in the Chinese context, but you find it in many cultures yeah. as well, like in in Japan and in India, and in, in South Africa, of course in America and, and Europe. So this is not just about you know. Um, China, I think it's sort of quite global, which makes this interesting, how it really changed for women. It's interesting you say that because next week, of course, we're opening an exhibition on graphic design in Germany, <laughs> which is exactly this period. And it, it was uh, quite bracing to think of the way the products are being advertised in China, because next week we'll see cigarettes, technological goods, uh, hair products, being sold in places like Berlin and Leipzig mm -hmm. and uh, it's made me think a bit more about transcultural and transference of issues between uh, these two very different centres but ultimately finding ways of attracting new markets for new goods, mm -hmm. cigarettes for example. Well I think we'll wind up this lunchtime's brown bag and if you would join me in thanking Sandy for this introduction to her work on Chinese advertising. Thank you. Sandy.